The death of a child at any age is devastating for a parent, but imagine when that death is a suicide, a tragedy that must feel insurmountable. Tonight, hear one parent's story and learn how we can bear the unbearable as we talk about coping with the aftermath of suicide, next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Suicide has a lasting impact on the survivors, the friends, family, and community who cared about and loved the person who took their own life. Tonight, we have two guests who have personal experience coping with the aftermath of suicide. One, a father coping with the suicide of his son, the other, a daughter coping with the suicide of a parent. And they're here to share their helpful insights and personal stories. So now, if you have a question for them, call locally, dial 218-788-2844, or call toll free at 1-877-307-8762. And you can also email us your questions using the address listed at the bottom of your screen. Let's meet our guests. Gina Dixon is the program manager of Essentia Health St. Mary's Grief Support Services. She's also a child survivor of a parent's suicide. And Adam Le Levy is probably best known in the last 20 years as the singer-songwriter for the band The Honey Dogs. He's here tonight to share his story of how he is learning to endure the unendurable, his son Daniel's suicide. Thanks to both of you for coming here tonight. And you know, I, I didn't mean to mess up your last name. It's Adam Levy. And it's so funny because for some reason I've been wanting to say Levy in my head and I keep saying, no, it's not Levy, it's Levy. And, and I've planted the wrong thought. Um, and I just want to say to the viewing audience that um, w one of the things that you will be seeing tonight um, that you have the luxury of seeing tonight is some of pictures of Daniel and not just pictures of him but some of his artwork and so I think a nice place for us to start Adam would be for us just to tell us a little bit about who your son was. Daniel was a, a brilliant uh, magnetic kid uh, from a very early age and he became uh, a, a amazing artist in his adolescence. Uh, he was normal, you know, normal I say in quotes, by many standards. He was well liked by kids. He was into boxing and skateboarding, um, but he, uh, you know, somewhere early on in adolescence started to show signs of, of suffering from mental illness. And then how was that journey for you with him through his own, uh, his, his, both his childhood, that combination of that, that, that childhood in his young adult years, and then as his mental illness was, was developing? I struggled with mental illness myself, and so it wasn't, uh, I mean, it's always painful to, to watch a child suffering from any sort of uh, illness, and it was painful and difficult, but I felt like we talked about it pretty openly. And when we had a clue that something was wrong, um, we addressed it and he was comfortable talking about that with us as well. So it didn't feel like there was this period of sec secrecy around it. Um, we dealt with it fairly quickly, but it, it you know, rapidly sort of got out of everybody's control and understanding. And you know, part of what you just said was that there was never a sense of secrecy about his mental illness fr from the beginning. And one of the things that I have been so struck by in both in talking with you and, and sort of doing a little bit of research for tonight's show is, is that number one, you're here talking about this, but you had, you started, I think one of the f first interviews maybe that you did at least pub to the public interviews was two months after uh, Daniel died because you had just released an album at the same time. And so around a, su a subject where many families just run and hide from that, you have been so public. And tell us a little bit just about your decision to be public. 
Well, the being public uh, in talking about what we've gone through and what my son suffered through, for me feels incredibly natural and therapeutic to be able to develop a story. Essentially, that's what you're doing. You're kind of trying to make sense of mm -hmm. what has happened because it's incomprehensible. Uh, the death of your child, a child whom you love, who received the adoration of family, um, how does this happen? It's, uh, it, it's hard to wrap your head around it. So being able to talk about it and to be able to go back and sort of tell that story, his journey uh, and the struggles that we had with it has been really important. And there wasn't really any hesitation on my part in talking about it. And the numbers of people who've come forward to share their own stories, to provide their own wisdom about what they've been through or to, to kind of solicit my advice has been really uh, an essential part of my healing process. And Gina, you kind of wear two hats coming here tonight. You're not just the program director of St. Mary's Grief Services, but you also, as a child, had a parent, your, your mother. Uh, su My father. Your father, I'm sorry. Your, your father su suicided. And tell us a little bit about that. That's sort of the flip experience mm -hmm. of, of what Adam has. as He has, uh, you know, the parent with a child. You're the child with the parent. Well, what I can share with you is that uh, for my family, it was a much def different experience. Forty years ago, there wasn't a lot of uh, public awareness about um, depression and mental illness. There wasn't a lot of public understanding of alcoholism, which both were contributing factors in my uh, father's death. And so there was um, a tremendous amount of secrecy. Um, and unfortunately, um, that resulted in, because we couldn't talk about how my dad died, we couldn't talk about my dad. We couldn't talk about his life and the fact that he was teacher of the year and much beloved and this dynamic, intelligent, loving man. Um, all of that sort of was frozen in time because the trauma was so intense um, and our family just didn't have the tools um, to be able to talk about that and we're actively discouraged from talking about it by you know a lot of people that were um, influential in that that decision and did, did you know at the time that your father's death was a suicide uh, I was told as a 10 year old child um, I remember the police coming to the door and um, unfortunately though, the language in which uh, it was explained to me uh, <laughs> wasn't particularly helpful. I was given details of how he died, but not really um, an umbrella for understanding um, what was going on with his, with his health. And my brother was five at the time, and the decision was made not to tell him. And so, um, unfortunately, because it was difficult for my family to talk about when he was five, it was still difficult when he was 10, when he was 15, when he was 20, he still had not had any of those details shared with him, which really complicated his, his grief um, considerably. Now, you mentioned something about the, the way in which you were told and how that wasn't in, you know, on, on the one hand, maybe it was good that you were told the truth, but the way in which you were told wasn't the most helpful. What would you say, now if I ask you to sort of switch hats here sure. for, for a moment, what is the way that we would tell a survivor um, in order for that to have the chance of being the most helpful? Well. I, I really, when I have that conversation with parents, um, I encourage them to be honest in age-appropriate ways. And so sometimes even a very young child can be told that the person who died had a brain sickness and they died as a result of that sickness. And then later more information, you know, the name to that sickness can be added or a conversation about you know other 
um, details and a uh, rule of thumb is to provide as much information as the child is asking. So um, older children may ask more detailed questions and um, that's important that a child who is old enough to um, love is old enough to grieve and it can be more confusing when they hear misinformation from other sources or sort of get the message that what happened is too terrible even to talk about. And actually, Adam, you have younger daughters mm -hmm. and um, so must have been in the position then of, you know, uh, of bearing your own grief while explaining what has happened. How did you manage that? It was not a surprise to the girls that, that things were getting bad. Um, Daniel's visit, his last visit in uh, the holiday season in 2011 was a rough one for the girls because they really bore witness to the the profound sadness that Daniel was exhibiting. He didn't want to be a part of family events. We had to force him to wake up in the morning and eat with us and he was he was almost laconic. You know, he was he was checking out and it was absolutely frightening for his mother and for me and for his stepmother. Um, and the girls were, were very frightened and so we had to kind of talk about it and they knew that we were worried for some time. Mm -hmm. um, the actual death was, was, a, was an absolute catastrophe for them and they're going to spend the rest of their lives processing this. But I think talk, my talking about it publicly, their being able to see my conversations and interviews uh, and, and an openness about it, uh, providing answers to their questions and giving them privacy as well. You know, I, I allow the kids, since they're 15 and 12, to ask the questions that they feel they need to answer or they, they need answered. Um, and there's some things that they don't want to talk about right now. And I feel that there are, there are other kind of clinical settings for them that will probably be more appropriate in some ways. Um, but we talk about this stuff a lot. And I think part of it too is, is keeping memory alive and talking about Daniel in a great light because there was so much wonderful uh, things about his life and the culture that we created as a family. And to keep those things alive with the kids so that they're not just thinking that there was only darkness in his life. That was a huge part of, of where he went and, and why he killed himself but there was also great beauty in his life and what he contributed to, to my daughter's you know, psyches and, and development. Much like how what you just commented that you weren't able to recognize that, he was, that your father was teacher of the year, that, that, that he was not a person who was only defined by death, right? That there was so much more to this, to this human being, which is why I wanted to start off the show of tell me about the person who who, who you lost because there is more, more to them. Um, I, we, we have a question here and, and I think it is, it, is, it is a question that is often that friends and maybe other family members experience. Marion Duluth um, calls in and I'd like to have both of you respond to this but we'll start with you Adam. What does a person who has had a family member uh, suicide want to hear from somebody else. So, you, you know, if, if I'm your friend, I'm thinking mm -hmm. like, I don't know what to say, that what, what's the right thing to say, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. I want to be helpful. I don't want to be unhelpful. Mm -hmm. What has some of your experience informed on that? I'm going to start by answering that question of what is not a great thing to hear, yeah. and, and I can actually count on my hands the numbers of times I heard it. And it's either from people who are being very protective or from people who don't really understand the depth of depression that results in suicide. And that is uh, simply saying that that was a very selfish thing of that person to do. It, it goes without saying that suicide is a selfish act, but that doesn't explain it and that doesn't, it certainly doesn't make somebody feel good about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's reasons why the church made suicide a cardinal sin for so many years. It's absolutely one of the most socially disruptive acts a human being during the course of their life can do. My son's decision to kill himself was profoundly destructive socially. But I understand at a certain level that his misery and the pain that he was going through was so profound that 
he, the only way he could, could find any peace for himself was to leave. And so when people say to me, I feel horrible for you, I know the pain that you must be going through, or I have some sense of it, that is, the, you know, that, that is I think, about as constructive as people can be. It's really hard to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, we want support from people. We want acknowledgement. Um, but I understand it's really difficult for people to talk about it. Honestly, there are very few things people can say that are, that are hurtful or painful. Just acknowledging the pain that we're going through is, is a great, great thing people can say. And, and do you know what's been your experience, um, both personally and in working with, with, with others um, who are survivors of suicide? Well, I think to also take the question from another direction is that um, our culture is all about fixing things quick and people really want the magic recipe of what can I say that's going to make this person feel better. And I think a, a good starting place is to recognize that there is nothing that you can say that is going to remove their pain. You can be present with their pain. You can um, be a supportive listener and be respectful and be empathetic. Um, I would add to the list of things not to say. Um, I, I personally am uncomfortable when someone says, I know how you feel um, because even though I have experienced the death of a family member to, through suicide, every relationship is unique, every experience is unique, and so that in some way diminishes that um, individual relationship. Uh, so I think um, many people would prefer that you focus on the person's life, to say their child's name, to say their loved one's name, to check in periodically. You know, the Jello Brigade rushes in and people get all kinds of cards and all kinds of support early on. But then come Mother's Day or the birthday of the person who died or holidays or a year later, um, people are kind of expecting you to be that back to normal and grief doesn't work that way. It's a lifelong adjustment. So I know people will really say that they appreciate getting those those cards or those um, offers of um, practical support. Can I watch the kids? Can I take uh, uh, some garbage out for you kind of things rather than so much what they say is the showing up. Well, and I think that, you know, the, what, what you said, uh, I like what you said about the Jello Brigade <laughs> and, and that everyone's um, ready and willing to be supportive in those first, in those first few months. And, and I know, you know, y y I think you said you're sitting at 40 years. 40 years away. <laughs> You're coming up in a week, less than a week, on two years, mm -hmm. uh, on the second year an anniversary. And I don't know if you've ex what, what you've experienced from your own your own community or around that. If if they've if the Jello Brigade has has left, or if there's an if there's an understanding that this isn't the um, the American overnight fix. I, I think I, I have the benefit of, of a, a large network of friends and family who uh, continue to be supportive and to reach out and to check in on me, which I appreciate immensely, uh, and understanding that this is a lifelong struggle that I'm going through and that my daughters are going through, uh, and people have really risen to the occasion, um, and I think I've, I, I've actively gone out to try to get involved in things related to this to help other people, which has also helped me through this. Gina, let's talk a little bit about maybe how uh, surviving uh, a death like suicide or su suicide, since that's what we're talking about tonight, poses maybe some unique challenges different than um, a, a death that is either more expected or, or more general or, more, or more, a more common experience mm -hmm. that more people have? Well, there's a lot of complicating factors with suicide. Um, one can be the traumatic nature of how the person died, um, especially if family members or friends witness the per person's death. There can be elements of, you know, physical flashbacks and, you know, all kinds of mental health concerns that um, can be a part of that trauma that really invites um, professional support. Um, the other piece is we've talked about 
with social stigma that there can be a lot of um, misinformation about suicide. There can be a lot of stigma attached that that doesn't happen in loving families or that doesn't happen um, with popular kids. There must be a big secret. A big, and so people will focus so much on the why of the death um, that they really don't get the same degree of support that they're a grieving, vulnerable person. Um, sometimes people are really disrespectful about asking inappropriate probing questions rather than following the lead of the person who's grieving um, to let them know where their boundaries are. It can be very public. Sometimes the media can make that a more complicated or difficult situation where if family members want privacy, they're having a very difficult time um, attaining that. Uh, but more often people will say that they feel very isolated. I know when my family experienced it, I thought that I was the only one that it had ever happened to. And it really wasn't until I was in high school and later in college that be I began to learn more about really that there are millions of Americans who are affected by suicide. And, um, and thankfully, we're more able to, to talk about it now and that isolation is decreasing, but, but it's still out there and there can be a lot of judgment and, and family members will often tell me they feel very protective of the person who died and it's really hard for them to, to think of other people judging that person. How has that been for you and what your experience has been, um, Adam? Uh, especially around some of what Gina mentioned. You, you know, we, we know, and, th and this show is all about beating back the stigma mm -hmm. um, with respect to mental illness. And, and within, if we take a look at the stigma directed around mental illness, leading the pack would be stigma around suicide. And um, I think surviving parents, some people's, some surviving parents experience um, enormous guilt, um, not that they are guilty of anything, and, and uh, fears that they will be blamed. And how has that been for you? I think as a parent, you will always, in the case of a suicide, feel that you could have done more. And that tape that rolls in your head, you know, one more phone call, one more thing we could have done. Um, that's a gnawing sensation or, or uh, thought process that you have to struggle with. And I think the only way that I've really been able to cope with that is talking about it and also realizing that we did do a lot. Um, we were very aggressive in dealing with, with Daniel's situation. He was in emergency care a number of times. And, you know, you, you, you did what you could, but I know that that's one of the, one of the greatest pains that, I, that I'll, I'll have to live with for the rest of my life is what more could I have done? And how has this whole experience changed you? You know, I, I wish I was sitting here as a parent whose ch child attempted suicide and we got through it and he got all of the proper care and you know he's out of the out of the woods and I can't be that person unfortunately um, I think it's changed me in a number of ways one way is is the realization that as much as we try to live good lives and to give our children everything we possibly can and care for them sometimes it's not enough and Unfortunately, uh, you know, the system that exists as great as it is and as much help as we got was inadequate in being able to deal with Daniel's situation. And I don't harbor resentment towards anyone. I felt like I was in very close contact in the final days with all of his providers. And they did everything they could in terms of providing advice. But uh, here we are. And, and I think that that's so interesting too. what you said. I, I like what you said about um, the system for you, a, as much help as you had, it wasn't enough. And, and providers have that same sense of, of we know that if a person is determined to kill themselves, that there is nothing that we can do 
to stop that, a sense of helplessness uh, about that. And, and so, our, you know, our greatest hope is in part of it is destigmatizing mental mm -hmm. illness so more people get help and, and looking towards advances, certainly, in, um, in, in mental health treatment as, as, as we move forward. Gina, what has been your experience? Well, I think in closing, I'd like to just mention clinician survivors. We've been talking a lot about families, but you mentioned that um, as professionals, we're also impacted um, by the death of someone that we might be caring for that we feel a great connection with. And so there are also resources available for professionals who may be profoundly impacted um, by the death of someone um, in their care. So I appreciate that being part of the conversation today. I think that's very, very important. And we're just about out of time, Adam. Um, I introduced you as, as, as a person who is uh, learning to bear the, the unbearable. And for other people who are in your position right now, um, maybe even earlier than you are dealing with this right now, what would you say to them about that process of, of learning to bear the unbearable? Because you certainly are doing that. Self-care is incredibly important. Um, you know, taking care of my children is my priority and making sure that they are making sense of the unfathomable right now. But I also need to take care of myself and do healthy things that feel good. Um, there was a point where I felt like after my son's death, I would never know real joy again. And to, to realize that this is a process, it plays out, grief plays out, it doesn't fit uh, any particular model or certainly patterns that you can see, you can read about it, but there, you have to have a certain degree of faith and hope that you are, you are gonna get, in, get through this. Um, you're going to be altered profoundly, but you will feel joy again. And I think on that note, I have nothing more to say that you will feel joy again, that we can bear the unbearable and suffer the insufferable. Thanks so much for listening to these two wonderful stories. And don't forget to visit us on the web at speakermindonline.org, where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog, the place where I will answer more of your questions. And you can also email us your questions about next week's show, when we're going to be taking a left turn and talking about why aren't we happy. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.